Hi, you're listening to Yellow Glitter, a podcast on mindfulness through the eyes and soul of a queer Asian. I'm your host, Stephen Wakabayashi, and you're listening to a very special episode for this month of February on love, queer Asian love. I'm joined on this episode with Robin. Hi, Robin. Hi. Hi, hi. Robin Mealy, they, them, theirs, is a queer second generation Taiwanese American who currently works as a therapist on an inpatient psychiatric unit for adolescents at a public hospital here in New York City. They have a master's degree in dance movement therapy and they have their yoga teaching certification. They currently identify as asexual, pan romantic, and polyamorous. Oh, did I get that right? Yeah, that's that's everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wow, that's quite a bio and so much to unpack here. But first, I wanted to ask, how did you get to work as a therapist here in New York City? Yeah, so I, you know, I grew up my whole life dancing um, various styles and really just always loved expressing myself through uh body movement. Um, and then in undergrad, I studied psychology. I was always super fascinated. And I knew that I wanted to go back to school for something to do with uh, therapy. Um, and then actually, it was a chance uh, Google search that brought me <laughs> to dance therapy specifically. Um, I just thought that I knew about art therapy. And so I was like, well, of course, why, like, why doesn't dance therapy exist? Because it has always been so therapeutic for me to mm -hmm. move my body. Um, so yeah, I basically from there, like the rest kind of took off. Um, I got my master's at Pratt Institute uh, here in Brooklyn. Um, that was in 2018. Um, and during my time in school, I actually interned at the hospital that I now work at. Um, so it was like a good introduction to the work. And uh, it's like, yeah, it's been wonderful. Uh, I've only been at my current position technically for the last five months, but it's mm. been a wonderful five months. <laughs> yeah. And so what exactly is a mass... There's like sirens in the background. Oh, <laughs> quintessential yeah, New No, it's quintessential <laughs> New York. You can't have it without sirens. I will probably get that in a minute if I don't get honking noise in the street. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I just want to ask, so what exactly is a master's in dance movement therapy? What do you learn and what do you teach? Yeah, it's really interesting. So I think uh, inherently people can you know, understand that there's different ways of expressing yourself. Um, I think especially as uh, an Asian person mm -hmm. uh, and me as a female bodied person, uh, I often have a hard time speaking up verbally with words and expressing how I feel in that way. Um, and so dance therapy is based on the notion that you can communicate things that you're feeling and thinking through moving the body and not necessarily accompanied by words. Mm -hmm. um, so what I do with my patients is um, I basically hold the space for the teens to express themselves creatively. Uh, I use a lot of props because um, teenagers tend to be very self-conscious about the body. And so by putting other objects in the space, uh, it's easier for them to relate. And my job is to get them to feel um like they can relate to each other um, and build support uh, and do that through expressing themselves in movement. Wow. Yeah, that's so powerful. And so let's dive into your background a little bit. So you mm -hmm. wrote you are a queer second generation Taiwanese American, but yes. you also wrote to me earlier that you are half white. Yes, right? that yeah. is correct. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, Wow, that's uh, interesting. So how has it been being both Taiwanese and white growing up? Yeah, so my mom uh, immigrated to the States from Taiwan um, pretty late in her life. Um, and my father is like third and fourth generation white American on you know either side. Um, and I grew up in suburban New Jersey where it's it was predominantly a white town. Um, I feel like growing up uh, in elementary school, especially, I have distinct memories of, you know, 
not really wanting to identify so strongly with my mom because I wanted to fit in and I wanted to be a part of the communities that I was involved with. Um, and even like my dance world, my dance community was not a uh, super diverse. Um, and it wasn't until I went to high school and I kind of felt myself swing completely in the other direction. Um, I became like, I, I was like one of those anime nerds and like mm -hmm. sort of became obsessed with <laughs> Japanese culture. And, yeah. uh, but from there became more interested in my Asian heritage and, and, you know, exploring that and asking my mom questions and, you know, more interest in going there and experiencing mm. life in Asia. Um, and so, yeah, it was this interesting, like almost both extremes. Um, and then after I graduated from my undergraduate program, I mm -hmm. actually moved to Japan for two years and taught English oh, no there. Way. Yeah. Wow, um, so I got to experience that, which was also a very interesting experience as a half like Asian, like Mm -hmm. They were so confused mm -hmm. by me. They didn't know what I was. <laughs> they were like, you're half something. Are you Japanese? I don't know. Um, and so just a more instances of, you know, do I, I don't quite belong here. I don't quite fit in here. Um, do I pass? Do I not? You know, it was mm -hmm, an interesting mm -hmm. experience. Um, and so now, uh, actually through my graduate program, I've been thinking a lot recently about my racial identity mm -hmm. and what it means to me. Um, and yeah, it's still an ongoing sort of exploration, uh, mm -hmm. to see mm -hmm. how those two pieces interweave and, and yeah. what that looks like. Yeah. And I'm curious. So you mentioned you made this swing towards your Asian heritage in high school, right? Mm -hmm. What do you think catalyzed that? Um, I think definitely I went to a like um, regional high school. And so there was more diversity there for sure. Um, I became friends with a lot more like Asian kids. I think there was maybe like two in my elementary school and they weren't people I was necessarily friends with. Um, but then once I got to high school, it was like there were so many different kinds of people. Um, my two best friends from high school are Filipino. So there's that. Um, and it's just a way to feel like it was, it was okay. And it was like cool to be, you know, whatever, whatever I was. Yeah. Yeah. So fascinating. And I have some half white, half Asian friends as well. And I never <laughs> knew this as a part of their experience, but when I went to college with them, I remember having an intimate chat with them and I was just talking about inclusivity, our friends group, and kind of our experience during high school. And they had told me that, you know, during high school, I was never a part of the white community and I was also never a part of the Asian community. Almost mm -hmm. as, you know, they never were a part of any community because of this identity, this biracial identity. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious if you also had similar experiences with that as well. Yeah, definitely. I think, um, and, and speaking to other half or like biracial or multiracial friends that I have, uh, that's definitely a common thread of like never being, you know, whichever enough to be a part mm -hmm. of the group or belong to mm -hmm. the group. Um, and so, yeah, that's definitely, definitely part of it. Mm -hmm. Do you have any experiences when you were made to feel not part of a group that you thought you identified with or that you are that you identify with? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think in like sort of like microaggressions sort of ways and mm. like little jokes and things yeah. about um, like when I would hang out with Asian friends and be considered like the white one, like, like, Oh, just you're the white one or whatever. Um, in a way that was super invalidating when I felt so strongly aligned with my mm -hmm, uh, Asian mm -hmm. background. Um, yeah, it was, I think it's always been like slights. And so it never really registered until I started doing the work in my grad program of piecing apart my racial identity and looking back. Um, definitely, now, looking back, I can see more instances of where at the time I just kind of brushed it off. And now it's like, wait a minute. No, that was definitely racism. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Those microaggressions. And yeah, you keep mentioning, you know, doing this deeper exploration in grad school. And just curious if there was any experience that really stands out to you as a part of this exploration into this identity? 
Um, I mean, I've always considered myself uh, an academic. I love mm -hmm. like reading books and researching and things like that. And so uh, there was actually a, a course that we took in second year that was about, um, they called it cultural competency and social justice or something like that. Um, and we had to do a paper about our own racial identity using sort of the, there's like developmental um I guess, steps that you take. And so I remembered writing the whole paper based on my Asian identity. And at the very end of the paper, I was like, oh, wait, I'm also white. And I haven't really looked at that. Um, so yeah, that's kind of what has started me on this, qu this bigger question of like, what? Yeah, what is all of this? <laughs> mm, yeah. And so, yeah. And I want to get to kind of the meat of the discussion, which mm -hmm. is on love. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> Yay. Yeah. And so in your bio, you wrote asexual, paromantic, polyamorous. And, yeah, I love yeah. labels, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, uh, you know, for our listeners, what do all those terms mean? Yeah. So I, for a long time, uh, really resisted my queerness. Um, I actually came to asexuality first and still wouldn't use any other labels except for that. So that's the one that I feel the most at home in. Um, basically, there was a, an instance with a friend who uh, for a long time I was, you know, involved with uh, LGBTQ organizations, but always identified as like a straight ally and all of that. And I had a conversation with a friend who is part of the community and they, you know, they, they asked me point blank what I identified as. And I said, straight ally. And they said, Oh, that's not part of the community. And I kind of had a moment of like, well, I feel like I'm part of the community. So like, what am I actually? Um, and as seems to be a common thread for me, I went online and <laughs> researched a bunch of stuff and I came upon the um, Asexual Visibility Network, AVEN, mm -hmm. and they have an FAQ and I was reading through it and um, there was a question on it that said, I don't know, like, if I'm asexual, how do I know? Mm -hmm. And the answer had something written where it was like, well, here's a bunch of questions. And if you answer yes to any of them, like, you could be on the asexual spectrum. Mm -hmm. um, but really, it's like, you know, it's depends on you and and it's still a spectrum so you know there's different ways that it looks yeah. um and the one that stood out to me was mm -hmm. there was a statement that said uh i have felt at some point in my life that something biologically is like broken or wrong with me mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. and it, just reading that and and saying that aloud to myself it kind of put a lot of my past relationship history into perspective. And I was like, oh, that's why that was really uncomfortable or why I didn't feel like I could say something. Um, and yeah, so that just really solidified it for me. Um, and once I took that on, I started, you know, looking more into, well, okay, once I take, you know, the sex piece off the table, yeah, what what am I really looking for then in relationships? Cause I thought that I, I would always define it by like, Oh, it's like a really close friend and we have sex and that's what it is. Mm. Um, but once that sex piece was off the table, I was like, well, so what am I interested in? Like romantically, emotionally, um, and started piecing apart all of those things, which is why I have so many labels now. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, yeah, because then in thinking about love, I was like, well, I love people. I love like any type of person. I don't really, you know, the other stuff doesn't really matter. And then, um, yeah, it came to polyamory sort of in a roundabout way um, in thinking about being asexual and mm -hmm. having relationships with people who are allosexual or people who have sexual attraction um and what does that mean and is there a way to do that uh do it like do i have to be in an open relationship do i have to have do they have to have other partners um uh and so for me actually there was a book that a friend recommended to me mm -hmm. that i helped clarify a lot of those questions for me um it's called opening up by tristan taramino 
-hmm. And it is basically like a how-to guide of different types of open and poly relationships. Um, oh, and the thing that helpful. I really liked about it, yeah, it, it was awesome. It um, The author interviews a bunch of different uh, people in relationships. Um, and the thing that I really liked about it was at the end of every chapter, the author kind of says, well, this is how these people are doing it and it's working in this way. But if that doesn't work for you, then that's this is not for you. <laughs> um, and so it really just clarified for me that like, well, it is possible to have, you know, any type of relationship. Mm -hmm. um, it's really more important to check in with yourself and see what you're okay with um, and communicate that openly and honestly. Mm, wow. Yeah. So fascinating. And when did you realize maybe you were different from everyone else? Um, like in terms of relationships? <laughs> relationships, sexuality, identity. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, maybe there were always kind of these thoughts um, throughout, like growing up. But I think it, I really came into this uh, once I found like some queer community for myself. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess for me, it was actually pretty, pretty late in the game, maybe only in grad school and beyond. Mm -hmm. um yeah so i'm still i still feel like a baby queer <laughs> like exploring new york city yeah um yeah <laughs> yeah and um a lot of these labels too you know they have so many interesting stigmas attached to it mm -hmm. too right yeah like the asexual stigma of um kind of just being boring right Poly yeah. <laughs> yeah 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 polyamory yeah um being very sexual right overly sexualized yeah. and so what stigmas maybe have people attached to you based on these and yeah i'm just curious to learn more about these yeah i'm actually it's interesting that you say that i feel like i as i've sort of been more upfront about putting these labels on myself and um, like coming out to friends and having these discussions. Um, I haven't really felt uh, too much of that. I think my friends have been really good about like having this, these open conversations with me. Um, I've actually found that it, I've, there's an interesting dynamic where I have a few uh, friends who are male who are also polyamorous. Yeah. And they get a lot of, um, mm, you know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. am I allowed to curse on this? <laughs> yeah, go for it. <laughs> okay. Well, they just get a lot of shit about yeah. being poly and like, oh, it's like, oh, you just want to like sleep around mm, and that. Yeah, um, yep, yep. But, and, and maybe it's also a difference of I lead with, well, I'm asexual, but I'm polyamorous. So, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, you so it's both, clearly yeah. not about the sex for me. It's mm -hmm. just about, um, you know, having connections. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, that's fascinating. And there are like all these, you know, stigmas attached to even just being a lesbian, even being gay, mm -hmm. even just being queer. And I think mm -hmm. the thing about these, you know, these stigmas or these labels is for other people to try to understand something that they don't identify with mm -hmm. without putting in the effort, right? Yeah, yes. It's these labels that's like, okay, if I stick this label on it, I totally understand exactly what it is. Mm. But all these terms, they're all so gray. And when you layer in all these layers of identities on top of it, right, I think it becomes so unique to people that you almost can't even label things. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it's true. I think um, I was, this is kind of related mm -hmm. my yeah. I was having a discussion with a friend about um like gender identity and how um the way they, they said something like the way to make you know the answer isn't to add more check boxes of options like it's not just like male female and now we add all these other things it's to just get rid of the boxes altogether mm -hmm. it's like it's more about just being you and and if labels serve you then like that's great mm -hmm. um i just think it becomes a problem when other people like you said use labels to be like oh well now i know your experience yeah. and that's it and i don't otherwise care about who you are as a person 
Yeah, I think the gender labels is really fascinating too because、mm-hmm. how they've perpetuated, right? Are these systematic programs that were meant to identify the type of person you were based on off these genders, right? So if we think about like health, for example. You are treated a certain way, whether you're a man or a woman, and they just assume、mm-hmm. that you're going to respond to these treatments so similarly to all the men, right? Just because you have this label.、Mm-hmm. And I think as we're doing more and more research into everyone and how they, you know, it's not just how they identify, but even genetically, right? A genetic、mm-hmm. label. I mean, a gen- at the genetic level, they are a spectrum, you know.、Mm-hmm. And even when we talk about like chromosome, you have X, Y, you have XX, but some people have XXY chromosomes、mm-hmm. too. And、mm-hmm. yeah, it's、uh, these labels, I think, as we develop more and more, we can start hopefully migrating off of them.、Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so I'm curious about your identities. How has it been like to be a sexual, panromantic, polyamorous? Within the Asian community, yeah,、um, it has been. I feel like I'm, as I said, still kind of coming into these spaces and learning what that's like for for me.、Um, and yeah, I feel like I usually just lead with "I'm asexual," and then like that's it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because、um, it's it is a lot at once to、yeah. throw at someone. Yeah.、Um, But then, you know, I I kind of use it as like a litmus test of、mm-hmm. if they don't run away after that, then <laughs> we can get into this other、yeah. stuff that's a little more nuanced.、Mm. Um, yeah. <laughs> so,、um, but it has been. I feel like it's,、uh, you know, in all different queer spaces, it's almost still、uh, a lot of educating,、uh, even、mm. with asexuality.、Mm-hmm. Yeah.、And、what about the queer community? How has the queer community responded? Um, it's、um, it's actually. I mean, it's been pretty okay. I think the spaces. Well, I'm I'm a dancer, and so a lot of the queer spaces I go to are like dance spaces, mm, and、yeah. <laughs> um, I think in those places, it's you know, I'm like, well, I'm just here to like dance, and like it. it it's always been at, it, like related to my work, you know. It, it's expression through movement, and and that's it. And yeah, it's been really accepting in that way. And people, I think, in the queer community are generally more、uh, on board with、um, consent and and making safe spaces for people who, yeah, people like me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm just curious, you know. What are you looking for? You know, you are always looking for all these relationships. Are there any qualities that you find really attractive within people?、Mm, I think、um, I really I'm I'm attracted to people that I can have like these conversations with.、Mm-hmm. Um, so the more people I meet that you know we align on different things, whether it's like. How we grew up, or you know, our thoughts on poly, or our thoughts on、um, queerness, or Asian identity. Like those people, I feel like I tend to、um, gravitate more towards because there's more understanding at baseline.、Um, so there's that. I also think I'm、uh, attracted to people who are trying to. Become like the best version of themselves, whatever that means to them, or like the truest version of themselves, and people who can be honest about that journey,、um, and like are actively working towards.、Um, just because I feel like I am also in that process, and it's very hard for me sometimes to look at people who aren't doing that. <laughs> it's frustrating. <laughs> Yeah, it's funny that I was also thinking about this quote in my head. I was reading from a book where、uh, the author talked about we are attracted to the qualities that we are working on. Oh, interesting! Yeah, I haven't heard that yet, yeah, but yeah, yeah. that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> yeah. So whether it's、um, it could be in many different ways. So a lot of people who are attracted physically, right? They could either just be really focused on making themselves physically fit, but also still navigating the relationship with the physical body as well, 
right?、Mm. Yeah, yeah. So, what we are attracted to is an outward expression of the stuff that we are still on a journey to understand more about ourselves. Ah.、Mm, interesting. Yeah,、huh? that makes so much sense. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I'm just curious, what are your thoughts on dating apps? Have you tried them? I have.、Mm -hmm. um, I'm on quite a few of them. <laughs> right now? <laughs>、um, yeah. So、um, I actually just found this. My friend recommended this new one to me. It's called Lex.、Oh, how, do you, how do you spell that? Uh, L E X. <laughs>、okay. I have not heard of that one. Okay. What's it about? Yeah.、Um, it's for,、um, it's basically for like queer,、uh, bisexual, asexual. Asexual is in the description.、Mm, wow. <laughs>、um, yeah. And it's for、uh, like women predominantly.、Mm -hmm. um, so maybe that's why you haven't heard of it. <laughs>、um, <laughs> yeah. But it's been really nice. It's kind of it's set up like. Craigslist almost, where you like post ads and people respond to them.、Oh, um, uh -huh. And you don't really have like a profile. It's just like your name, your age, where you are.、Mm -hmm. um, and you can attach your Instagram, but you don't have to.、Um, mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. And pronoun.、Mm -hmm. uh, oh, and that's, that's pretty much it. <laughs> yeah. But it's been really nice because it's, 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 A dating app, but also like not. People are on there looking for just making connections with cool people.、Mm. Um, and so, yeah, I've met quite a few really cool people through the app.、Um, some in like a dating capacity and some in not. And、uh, it's all been really good though, really fun. Nice. Yeah.、Uh, what? So let me ask you maybe on the flip side, what apps? Were you just really not into?、Mm, well, I guess so. When I started going on the apps、mm -hmm. like years ago, I guess the first one I had was Coffee Meets Bagel. <laughs> yeah. And how was that?、Uh, it was okay. <laughs> <laughs> and then, well, and then there, I、mm -hmm. downloaded Tinder because everybody had Tinder.、Mm -hmm. But on my profile, I had put something、yeah. that said, like, I'm here for cuddles only because it was、mm -hmm. when I was starting to come into my gotcha, asexuality. Gotcha. And some person matched with me just to tell me that I was on the wrong app. What? <laughs> I was like, excuse me. But they had,、um, they had to like swipe on you. But to they be swiped able to on say, me、yeah. to say, yeah. I was like so confused.、Um, yeah, never responded, obviously. But、uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, and then after that,、uh, yeah, I, I went on Hinge like a little bit. That one felt good in that it was like, like friends of friends.、Um, it felt a little bit safer to me.、Um, I don't think I ended up meeting anyone off of that app.、Um, I have like, yeah, a love hate relationship with dating <laughs> apps where I like am really intensely on、yeah. them for like a long time and、yeah. then I just like stop and don't meet up with anyone or do anything about anything. <laughs> well, that's how they get you, you know? They、yeah. <laughs> make you, you know, answer all these questions, post all these pictures, <laughs> respond to all these people before you even get a match, right? Yes, and you're like,、yes. <laughs> oh my God, I already put in this much effort. I might as well stick it out, right? Yeah. And then, <laughs> and then you're like, But this isn't really good. I really don't like it. But、yeah. let me just see. Let me just give it another day. Let me give it another week. Let me just. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And, and then, like, what? A month flies by, a year flies by, and you're like, oh, goodness. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah, and it's almost like this like, app overload, too, right? There's like so many apps. There's so many apps. <laughs> yeah, for like everything, too, right?、Mm -hmm. You know, and. I'm really glad, you know, Lex. I haven't heard of it, but I'm really, you know, intrigued by、uh, the platform itself. And I'm always, always, you know, very grateful for more inclusive platforms and spaces, you know? Yeah, definitely. If any of your listeners,、uh, <laughs> yeah. this feels yeah, like it yeah, applies yeah. to you, come find me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I know in the gay space, you know, the. Predominant one globally, at least, is Grindr, you know,、mm -hmm. and that one is so. I i i just don't agree with many things they do, you know,、mm -hmm. and it's just so. But across many of the apps, too, they're just so, um, they're so superficial sometimes, too,、mm -hmm. right? 
because that's Definitely. your first impression of someone. It's that little square photo, and it's all you get. Right. You don't even get a name. You don't get anything else in most of these apps. Maybe you get like mm-hmm. an online now, right? You get like a little green dot, and uh, yeah, like and that's, that's about it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and you have to make this like snap judgment about something that could potentially be very big. So. Yes. Yeah, it's really strange. Yeah, and you're like, <laughs> should I spend my whole life based on this photo? This like <laughs> 50 pixel by 50 pixel photo? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mm. So I wanted to ask something very pervasive in the Asian community, racial mm-hmm. fetishism. Have mm-hmm. you faced this as a half-white Asian biracial individual? Yes. I mean, I, it's funny. I was talking to a friend recently about this. Um, my friend is a, basically they're in a inter or yeah, interracial couple right now. Um, and that question of like fetishism came up and so my friend is a white woman. She came to me seeking advice about it. And I was like, honestly, I feel like in the past, and maybe even still now, that question is always in the back of my head. Mm-hmm. Um, like, is this what this is about? Or, uh, you know. When other people get you, right? Yeah, yeah. So it's kind of like, yeah. And I, I think maybe retros, like retrospectively, um, there were, depending on the partner, like yeah. it was a bigger question or like one that was a little more in the forefront um compared to others but yeah i don't know if that question ever goes away i think I, and that's what i told my friend i was like i don't know if i if that would ever disappear not to say that it's the most important thing or it's always true but it's always there yeah and how do you advise her you know just how do you navigate it yeah i mean i think it's just a matter of accepting that that maybe is always going to be there and Mm -hmm. if it ever comes up to be okay having an uncomfortable conversation about it Mm -hmm. um and just being open yeah Yeah, i think so Mm, that's really good advice and i'm just curious are there any other pieces of advice you would give to your younger self navigating love if you were to turn back time (laughs) i would tell myself to try try not to make any rush decisions and mm-hmm. to really sit with how I felt about certain things, yeah, before doing something about it mm-hmm. uh, in terms of love specifically, yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm curious, why, uh, why would you say that to yourself? Try not to rush into decisions. Um, I think I just had a tendency to like, yeah. if something like, nice enough or someone like nice enough came along I'd be like yeah okay whatever we can you know date that's fine but I don't know that I was as in if I was actually interested I don't know um and I think especially when it comes to like the asexuality stuff um and sexual encounters uh there was definitely a lot more of like I just would do things because I thought that's what I was supposed to do and I was like well and we're together already so this is kind of just what's expected and Mm -hmm. didn't actually sit with the fact that like actually i'm really uncomfortable and i don't want Mm -hmm. this Mm -hmm. yeah Yeah. doing a inventory of what you really need right yeah exactly yeah yeah are there any books or resources that have helped you a lot with navigating love um uh, definitely opening up the book i mentioned before about polly um Other than that, I don't know. Not off the top of my head. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Have you read the five love languages? Oh, yes, I have. (laughs) That one I have read. (laughs) I feel like uh, I always talk about love and recommendations and that book always comes up. Yeah, I didn't realize that um, there's like the the main one and then uh, the author wrote like a bunch of other ones targeted at specific types of people. There's like Did a specific he? one that's like no for idea. single people. <laughs> what? There's one that's no specific idea. for yeah. Um, so I I've only read the the uh, main one, but apparently yeah. He's running out of things to monetize. 
<laughs> yeah, I guess so. <laughs> That's so funny. It's like chicken soup for the soul, but yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's what it reminds me of too. <laughs> oh, interesting. I need to check that out. But I'm curious, what is your love language? Um, so I remember uh, definitely physical touch is number one for me. Mm, definitely, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, which is mm-hmm. funny coming from an asexual person, yeah. but I'm telling you, it works. Huh. <laughs> Mm-hmm. That is so what's that you know how is it like navigating that when um, you're asexual but your yeah. love language is physical touch yeah it's uh very i think can be very confusing for people um but i think as i become more comfortable like saying what i want and saying no when the time to say no has come uh it's becoming a little bit easier to navigate. And I've been fortunate to like meet people who are really understanding of that and really Mm -hmm. respectful. So, um, yeah. Mm, Yeah. Not all touch has to be sexual, right? Exactly. Yes. (laughs) Yeah. It's like when you give a hug to your like mom versus, you know, your partner, it might be Mm -hmm. charged very differently, but both can still not be sexual, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Okay, so I have a couple rapid-fire questions for you. Yeah, okay. You ready? <laughs> uh, I don't know, but let's do it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> okay, what do we need more of in love? Mm, more communication. More communication. More. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What do we need less of in love? Mm, mm, patriarchy. <laughs> mm. <laughs> That's a good one. Mm-hmm. And what is inspiring you lately? Mm, I I recently have taken up learning ukulele, and that's been <laughs> amazing. Uh, yeah, inspiring my creativity in a way that's been feeling stunted recently. <laughs> Can you play songs all the way through now? Uh, ki- yeah, kind of. <laughs> Just like chords; it's nothing complicated. <laughs> yeah, I can't even do that. I pick it up, and it sounds like uh, I broke it, but it's not broken. Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it has this like sad kind of. Oh, <laughs> oh no! <laughs> <laughs> and then I'm like, I think it's broken, and I'll hand it to my friend, and they're like, "Let me play it," and then they play it completely fine. It's beautiful. It's crisp, oh. and I'm like, oh. <laughs> it's okay it'll get better it gets better (laughs) yes thanks um practice makes progress yeah for sure for sure for sure um yeah so thank you so much for coming on i'm curious if you have any last words of wisdom for our listeners um i think the number one uh like motto that I have for love and relationships is timing is everything. Um, So just because something's not working out right now, doesn't mean that it won't work out later, but also if something's working out right now might not be forever. So might as well just be Mm. in whatever you have and be in it fully. (laughs) Yeah. Being mindful and present. Mm -hmm, Definitely. Wow. That's powerful. And where can our listeners find you or reach out to you? Um, probably the easiest way is um, I'm on Instagram all the time. Um, nice. My handle is uh, Rob Binks. It's Robin KS. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. So follow me there and, and I will answer DMs. Woohoo. <laughs> <laughs> Woohoo. Yeah. So thank you so much for coming on. It was such an absolute joy to talk to you. Yeah, this is really fun. Thank you for having me. (laughs) Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. And yeah, that's it for this episode of Yellow Glitter on Love. If you also want to get in touch with me, you can reach out to my Instagram at Steven Wakabayashi. And if you enjoyed this, please leave a rating and review. It takes a few seconds. If you have a few minutes, please leave me a comment. It helps other people find this podcast and our conversation here as well. And with that, so much love for you and hope your day can be a little bit more mindful. Bye now. Bye.